All right, welcome to our presentation. We're going to be talking about DSC for PowerShell 7 today. I'm Steve Lee. I'm the Software Engineering Manager for PowerShell team. Hey, I'm Michael Green. I'm the Program Manager for Azure Guest Configuration. So let's uh, kick things off. I wanted to first kind of start with a demo of what this will look like whenever um, everything that we're working on now comes together and is available you know, completely as a hybrid management service. Um, so I recorded a quick video. Let's just walk through it, and then we'll actually tease out all the details that make this work. Let's take a look at how the new DSC will be used as part of Azure Guest Configuration. So I've got a sample uh, implementation here of just a file resource that's written in PowerShell. And all this does is create a file and put some content there. You can see it has an example of an enum for ensure, an example of an embedded class, and then three functions, get, set, and test. And these are just normal PowerShell functions. Get file is going to collect information and return it as nice, pretty strings inside of a hash table. Set is just going to create the file if it doesn't exist and set the content. And test is just going to run get and then make sure that the properties of the current file, if it exists, match what was input um, and then return a Boolean. As far as this being a class-based implementation, the class is really just a wrapper for those functions. So I'm still gonna run all of my tests against those three individual functions, and then I'll test that DSC is doing what it's supposed to do. But my life is actually a little bit easier because I don't have to worry about authoring a schema moth and getting all the folders where they need to be. I just have the PowerShell module and manifest. I am gonna need a moth file if I want to use this configuration. So let's switch over and take a look at an example moth file. I'm not even going to worry about compiling a configuration for this demo because it's really simple. I'm just worried about ensure present at this path with this content. So this moth file is actually pretty small and not a big deal. Um, and if you've seen the guest configuration module in the PowerShell gallery, you can see all the commands pipe cleanly from one to the next. So I can tell it, Take this MOF, pull the file module out of PS module path, create a package, publish it to blob storage, create an Azure policy definition, and publish it for me. So I don't have to be an expert in these technologies. In fact, if I run it right now, um, you can see the output. It's really nice and easy for me to just go take a look that, yep, I've got the MOF file here, and the file resource we were just looking at as a module cleanly showed up inside of that package. So um, it also created a policy for me. So I can go out and use this as part of Azure policy. It's actually already been published. And if you want to take a look at the resource that would live in Azure, they would handle this. You can think about this as an extension or a provider for a virtual machines. So for Microsoft.compute slash virtual machines, I have a guest configuration assignment. For the machine WinDSC0, I'm mapping create file, and that's hosted in storage at this location, and also a hash value so I can make sure it doesn't change behind the scenes. So let's take a look at the output and what would happen if I were to use this today. Well, I can audit this Windows machine. So this is just running server 2019, and it checked, it found the file, but it, it was expecting that content to be DSC rocks, but the actual was foo, so it was returned actual as absent or not in compliance. But then I thought, well, sure, you can audit Windows Server 2019, but let's take a look at some new capabilities we've never had before. So I deployed Red Hat 8, SUS Linux Enterprise Server 15, Ubuntu 20, and then just to really test it, let's go backwards to Windows Server 2012 in addition to our WinDSC machine. I also set this into a new mode, which will allow us to now deploy configurations that are written in DSC using PowerShell Core cross-platform. So for my Red Hat 8, you can see the file resource has returned compliant. Well, that doesn't really tell me too much. Can you prove it? Yep, actually I went and did the run command, uh, got the details from testdsc.txt, and you can see the content is DSC rocks. So the results from this page are accurate. Uh, this machine returned compliant. It created the file, put the right content there. But what about for other new versions of operating systems? Here's Ubuntu 20. Same thing, the file resource came back compliant. 
SUS Linux Enterprise Server, you get the idea now. And then even for Windows Server 2012, going backwards compatible almost 10 years, the file resource uh, created the file successfully and returned compliant. Now, the way that I orchestrated this across all those machines, I didn't have to go out and manually create those assignments. I used Azure Policy. So you can see I have a uh, assignment here to configure a test file. And I've got my WinDSC file showing non-compliant. But if I switch over to compliance, there's my 2012 uh, SUS Linux, Ubuntu 20, and Red Hat 8 machines where I put it into deploy mode and all of them came back compliant. Um, so really happy with our progress on this. And I hope that you also will soon be able to test it in the near future. Thank you. So Michael, for those of uh, the viewers who don't quite understand DSC yet, can you explain to them what desire state configuration is? Yeah, I think that helps us to kind of start from the beginning. So we've been working on DSC for a long time. Um, this originally shipped back in Windows Management Framework 4. And uh, it was part of, it's part of Windows PowerShell 5.1. If you have a, happen to have a Windows machine in front of you, a lot of the stuff that um, we've been working on, you know, you, you can interact with right now. And the, the core idea behind desired state configuration is to author in a language abstraction uh, that, that PowerShell is supporting that is both declarative and idempotent. So the idea of declarative, you can kind of sort of think about it like a living answer file, but it's, I, I just want to be able to say this feature should be turned on or this service should be running or this account should be enabled. And then all of the imperative code logic, which would mean something like install feature or start service or create, I guess it'd be new account, something like that. Uh, that that's all happening behind the scenes and these structured uh, PowerShell modules that are supporting uh, the configuration itself. And the notion of being idempotent just means once you've got that configuration defined, you should be able to run it over and over again and always get exactly the same results. Um, and that really becomes like your living build doc for the service. So instead of having a Word document where you would, you know, describe for the next person that's going to build your ideal web server where to click in IIS, they're going to be able to go and look at this single configuration and understand at a glance exactly how it was built and easily reproduce that same server, which means you can share it. Like across your organization, you'll be able to say, let's all kind of agree on some best practices and then in a composable way, move those in and out of our configurations easily. Um, again, just doing more than, you know, publishing that through a Word document. So the engine behind the scenes that's actually handling all of that orchestration within Windows was called Local Configuration Manager. Um, and that ships as part of Windows Server and Desktop. And it is what's taking that configuration and then mapping all the PowerShell modules that are supporting it and actually running through it and understanding that one thing might depend on another and so on and so forth. It actually has a very strong dependency um, on Windows management instrumentation and on Windows PowerShell. And on Linux, very similar. Uh, it's got a strong dependency on OMI. And uh, it, it's, it's really a lot of the commands that it's using are, are very tightly coupled into um, that Windows operating system and the OMI implementation. So before we continue, let me just give a quick overview of PowerShell 7 for those of you who are still on Windows PowerShell to kind of get an understanding of how we got here. We started this um, project, PowerShell Core 6, about five years ago, and the focus really was how do we make PowerShell cross-platform so that uh, existing Windows PowerShell users can actually start managing hybrid um, cross-platform solutions. Uh, and so we made a big effort to port our .NET framework code to .NET Core, which was already cross-platform at the time. And we also focused really on cloud scenarios early on. So we partnered with Azure, AWS, uh, Google Compute Cloud, and also VMware to make sure that when PowerShell Core 6 first released, there would also be commandlets available compatible with PowerShell Core 6 and now PowerShell 7 that worked across all those different clouds. One of the important decisions we made early on was to ensure that PowerShell 7 and PowerShell Core 6, which is no longer supported, uh, work side by side with Windows PowerShell. So what that means is that if you have scripts running Windows PowerShell today, those will continue to run in Windows PowerShell. Like you should not have to make any changes there if they're running and you're happy with them. 
as you're making new investments and writing new scripts and you want to leverage some of the new capabilities in PowerShell 7, you have to make a, a deliberate decision to have those scripts run in PowerShell 7 because the executable is different. Now, as people start moving towards migrating towards PowerShell 7, we recognize that we didn't have full compatibility with existing Windows PowerShell uh, modules. So we did spend a big effort in the PowerShell 7 timeframe to work with Windows partners. So these are inbox modules shipped with Windows. And we worked with them to validate whether they would just work with PowerShell 7 or not. And for the ones that did, uh, we update the module manifest. So PowerShell 7 notices this and loads it directly. For cases where we know that they won't because they're depending on some .NET framework capability that is not ever planned to be ported to .NET Core, then we added a compatibility layer in PowerShell 7 to automatically know this and load it in Windows PowerShell and leverage PowerShell remoting so that you can use implicit remoting and make it seem like those commands were natively in PowerShell 7. All of, of those things sound like they, they line up perfectly with DSC. Um, you know, we want that to be a, a modern configuration management language. Um, so it would be important to work across Windows, Linux, uh, and certainly at least be able to do developments on Mac OS. Um, and it's interesting that it, it works side by side with Windows PowerShell and that compatibility is a major area of focus because there are so many existing DSC resources in the PowerShell gallery. So it's, it's really key that as we take DSC forwards that we have as much support as possible for those existing community investments without having to to restart the work effort there. Absolutely, and that's why we're talking, having this presentation today about what investments we're making. So again, uh, like we mentioned, you know, one of the big focuses, and if you look across the industry, cross-platform is very important. So that is a uh, important focus for the new DSC work to make sure that it works the same way on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. One of the big changes that we had to make in PowerShell itself, uh, for those who don't know, the configuration keyword is actually part of the PowerShell engine. And one of the desires that we have is really to decouple DSC from PowerShell itself. That way you can actually install newer versions of the DSC PS Desire State Configuration module on uh, long-term service supported versions of PowerShell 7. So that way you don't have to always move to the latest version of PowerShell to get the latest version of DSC. So one of the side effects of that decision is that we're going to stop shipping the PS Desire State Configuration module with PowerShell itself, starting with 7.2. Uh, that means that you'll just install from the gallery. As part of making things cross-platform, we had to reevaluate the dependency on MOF. So MOF is a format that's heavily used in WMI as part of SIM, but it really wasn't adopted heavily across the industry. And now these days, things like YAML and JSON are much more heavily supported as a serialization format for objects. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going to be upset about uh, shifting from MOF to a, a newer, more modern file format. I think everyone should be happier, and, and I'm personally happy, even though I did a lot of WMI work previously. Um, yeah, so, so one of the side effects of that decision is that we're no longer supporting script-based resources which depend on a MOF file to define the schema. So instead, we're going to be leveraging PowerShell classes entirely um, as a way to have cross-platform or authoring um, DC resources that work cross-platform. Now, to enable folks who already have a large investment in script-based resources for uh, DC on Windows, we're actually going to have also make available some tooling that will make it easier to automatically wrap existing script-based resources as PowerShell classes. And we'll have an upcoming demo on what that looks like. And that's, like I mentioned before, like compatibility with the existing community um, created content. That tooling will be a big help um, because it, it really doesn't need to be that big of an undertaking to get to class-based framework if we approach it correctly. That's right. And, you know, I think the thing that makes PowerShell successful is a community, and we also need the community to make DSC successful as well. Uh, and finally, there's no LCM support. Again, LCM is heavily tied to Windows, WMI, and OMI. Um, so in this new model that we're looking at right now, we're, we're really looking at it as a platform play. That means, uh, and we'll talk more about this in a bit, about bringing your own agent or using other agents like this config. So if you kind of, just to rewind what we just said, a couple of things that were super important. Um, one is that whenever DSC was originally built, we were super focused on the concept of private data centers. 
And as time has gone forward, there's a lot more focus on the cloud, a lot more focus on um, cap management capabilities becoming services. So we really need DSC to be flexible and be able to fit into both scenarios. But the changeover on Linux is absolutely huge. Like the, you know, the previous work for DSC on Linux, um, you know, really came at a time where PowerShell core for Linux uh, didn't exist yet. Certainly, you know, didn't have uh, we didn't have the popularity of uh, running PowerShell outside of Windows that you see today. So resources were written in C, um, heavy heavy dependency on OMI, which is getting a little outdated. And so shifting over to PowerShell Core is going to be a huge new opportunity uh, for DSC. We've been talking about that for a while, and now I think we're, we're seeing it start to come to fruition. Absolutely. Uh, I think it's important to note that we don't expect everything that we want to invest in for DSC is going to be complete in the 7.2 timeframe. So there are a few things that we're planning to do post 7.2, and some of these may show up in 7.2, but they're not the highest priority. Uh, one of them is open sourcing the PSSR state configuration module. So this is currently closed sourced. We are making some work already to kind of get the repo ready, but we also want to make sure that when we open source it, we're ready to take community contributions so that we can make progress on DC as a platform much more quickly. You mentioned this earlier, but PS desired state configuration module. So that includes the configuration keyword, and I believe compilation and the commandlets. Is that right? That's correct. So the idea is that the PS Desire State Configuration Module will be pretty much all, everything you need to use DSC as a platform. Um, and again, one of the things that we're looking at beyond 7.2 is more than just the resources, but also configuration files. So unfortunately, in the 7.2 timeframe, we probably won't be able to get around to this, which is moving from MOF to JSON as a format for configuration files and being able to parse those easily. But the shift to classes eliminates at least one. We don't yes. need the schema that moth anymore. And of course, um, we hope that people kind of follow us on this journey, even though it's kind of early in um, for DSC for PowerShell 7. But we really appreciate any feedback so that we know where to focus our efforts to make it easier for people to build their own tooling and own resources and configurations around our new platform that we're building for PowerShell 7. So, uh, I want to take a quick tour through uh, Azure Policy Guest Configuration, which is a lot of the, the um, components and pieces that you were seeing in that first demo that I did. Um, so we were one of the first teams to work you know, closely with PowerShell um, on what exactly DSC would look like as a cloud implementation. And for the last couple of years, we've actually been focused on a read-only implementation. You can think about that like um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good way to get started, get our performance where we want it, get stability where we want it, and we're just auditing the state of machines. And people have been asking, like, when are you going to get to remediation? And it's actually coming very soon. Um, and I, I have this notion of push to pull. Uh, so there's, you know, DSC has this concept of pushing a configuration to a machine or staging your configuration somewhere and then pulling it um, down to the machine. And uh, we kind of took a whole bunch of different areas for DSC and just listened to the feedback that we've seen on user voice and from all the different conferences we've um, attended over the, over the years and have these best of both worlds scenarios across scenarios like push versus pull and um, orchestration of uh, win set runs and actually incorporating gets. And uh, there, there's a lot more that will start to peel back the onion um, over the next few months, and, and you'll get to see more and more new features coming through the service. Um, it was super important that we make it Azure Native, so this doesn't include uh, an automation account or any special type of account within Azure. It's just going to be a, a native, built-in configuration management capability within Azure. Um, it's built completely on Azure Native resources, which means we're, we're just taking the best of what Azure has to offer and building a new service on top of it. And results get written out to interesting places like Resource Graph. So if you want to build custom dashboards and things like that, which has also often been a topic for DSC, um, some of these Azure Native capabilities are really nice um, to, to build on and, and really help you to move fast. So just like some of the things that Steve's been talking about, uh, it's cross-platform, and that'll be a new investment that we see coming soon, where um, as we start working more with PowerShell DSC on Linux, um, you'll see more and more content from Azure Guest Config start to uh, grow in that area, and also hybrid. It's been super clear from everybody's feedback that this can't be something that only works in Azure. So as part of the ARC 
uh, service. We can offer this to other public clouds and we can offer this uh, to on-premises data centers. So 2021 is actually a huge, huge year for Azure Guest Configuration. I think you'll see um, a lot of new features coming, including a lot of things that people have been asking for from DSC for a long time. So I'm super happy about it. Yeah, let me just add, it's been a great partnership with the Guest Configuration team. I think that having them be a partner tells us you know, what, how to prioritize real world scenarios and capabilities. And that's kind of like through those discussions we landed on how to best support Linux through class-based resources, how to make authoring easy and things like that. So next, I'm going to show a quick demo on um, actually using DSC for PowerShell 7. Uh, I'm going to show how to author a, a very simple class-based resource, uh, what it looks like if you were to convert an existing script-based resource. This will be running on my MacBook, so that shows it's cross-platform. And finally, um, we talked about bring your own agent. And I want to show like using just PowerShell script, you can write a very simple agent that does auto remediation to correct uh, configuration drift. This is a demo for using DSC with PowerShell 7. And specifically, I'm using PowerShell 7.2 Preview 4. And you can see here that I am using my MacBook. This is the, one of the new ones with the ARM64 processor. This will show that you can use DSC cross-platform. However, the same demo will work on both Windows and Linux as well. What I have on the upper part is a simple DSC resource that I wrote. The idea for this resource is that I want to be able to validate that the contents of a file is what I expect it to be. So here as a PowerShell class, I have the attribute DC resource on top. This lets PowerShell know that this PowerShell class is a DC resource. I have a key property that is the file path. This simply points to the path up to the file. I have a content property, which is mandatory. And this is just simply the contents of the file. And of course I have a get, set, and test methods. For get, I'm going to be returning back an instance of the class I have here. And I'm simply using the get content commandlet to read the contents of the file pointed to by the file path for this instance. And I'm going to set it as a value of the content property and I'm going to return it. For set, I'm using the set content commandlet. And for test, I'm using the get content commandlet again to retrieve the current contents. And I'm going to compare it to the contents that are currently stored within the instance to see if it matches or not. I wrote this script uh, to make it easy for me to demo this. And normally for lines one to five are not something you would need, but I'm going to explain why I need it here. So DC would normally search for DC resources within the PS module path. I have my DC resource in a demo folder, which is not in my PS module path. So I just do a check to see if it's not there. I'm going to add it. And here I need to import a specific version of PS desire state configuration module, which has additional changes necessary for this to work cross-platform. It is not one that we ship with PowerShell 7 currently. And the more interesting line is line 7 here. So I'm calling the invoke DC resource commandlet. The module name is the name of the module that contains my DC resource. The name is the actual DC resource itself. And in this case, the module and the resource have the same name. A module can contain multiple DC resources, but in this demo, I only have one. And if you recall previously, the class has a file path property, and this contains a path, uh, path to the test file I'm using, and I'm going to call the get method. So if I run this, then you can see that the current contents of the file should be welcome PS summit. And if I just get the contents directly, you can see that's exactly what is inside that file. So before I move on, I want to just show what that resource would look like if you were to convert an existing script-based resource to a PowerShell class. So the top part looks exactly the same. I also still have the get set and test methods, but instead of calling the get content set content uh, command list directly, just imagine this is your business logic. I'm actually calling some private functions defined later in this module. And I also have two additional constructors that I didn't need before because I will be constructing an instance of this PowerShell class to return back uh, as part of get. Here is the uh, get file content private function. So you can imagine the get set test here would be what is already in your existing script based resource. So for get, I'm doing the same thing as I did before. I'm using a get content commandlet. The only difference here is that I'm going to do uh, create a new instance of my file content class and populate the file path and the content that I just retrieved to return back. 
for set, set looks the same as before, and test is the same logic as it had before. So this version and the previous version would work functionally exactly the same. All this is showing is that you, if you have a lot of complex logic, you may not want to have it all stored within um, get set test itself. So you can always split those out as private functions or have a set of private functions. Or if you're converting from a script-based resource today, uh, it would look similar to this if you didn't want to just move all the contents of your existing functions into the class. So here we have a more complex scenario using the same resource. So one of the values of the local configuration manager that is not being provided in DC or Shell 7 is to auto-correct uh, when it detects that configuration has drifted from a desired state. So the way I'm doing that here is I'm using start job because I want this to run in the background. Again, it, I have the same lines as I had before to make sure that the environment, because start job is going to create a brand new run space, I want to make sure that run space is set up correctly to use my resource and also the, the specific version of the PS Desire State Configuration Module. Uh, here I'm using a PowerShell feature called splatting because down here you can see that I'm going to be invoking DC resource using that command at twice and I don't want to pass or specify those exact same parameters twice down here is not necessary so I just define it as a hash table and again I have the module name I have the name of the DC resource and of course I have the property specifying the path to the file and in this case I'm also saying that I want the desired contents to be DSC rocks. So the way this works is a very simple loop. Um, so this is while true, so this will run forever. So basically here it does invoke DC resource with the test method and it's going to check whether or not the contents of the file currently match my desired content. And if it's not in the desired state, then I'm going to now call the set method and set it to my desired content. And of course, um, I, I have it sleeping every 10 seconds. So in the real world, if you were to do this, you probably would want a longer sleep cycle. So it's not necessarily correcting every 10 seconds. So let's go ahead and run this. And again, this is a background job. And let's just check the contents of the file. So it still is the same as before. So And it, it has already gone through a loop and has auto-corrected it. So let's go ahead and stick something new in here. And again, if we check, it sees that the contents of the file is now this value one that I put in there. And again, because 10 seconds has elapsed, it's auto-corrected it again to the desired state. So you can see here, this is a very simple script showing that you can have a, a agent running DSC completely written in PowerShell script. Now, of course, this doesn't have all the capabilities of the local configuration manager. Uh, in this example, but certainly a large part of it could be written as a PowerShell script. Very cool. So I think uh, we covered a lot of content, um, and the, you know I think one of the key things really is we're reinvesting in DSC. I know that the community uh, hasn't been too happy because we've been kind of quiet about it, um, but this is really saying that hey, look, we're we're putting resources towards this, and you know appreciate the feedback and let us know where we need to uh, continue to improve DSC as a platform. Again, cross-platform is one of our key things. You know, as part of PowerShell 7, we're cross-platform focused. And for DSC for PowerShell 7, we absolutely need to be cross-platform as well. Again, MOF, thing of the past, um, we're not going to carry it forward. Uh, hopefully, this makes everyone's lives better. Uh, definitely more tooling for other formats like JSON. And I think it's very important that everyone recognizes that that we don't expect DSC for PowerShell 7 as a platform to be complete within the 7.2 timeframe. So this will be a continued investment. Um, again, we really appreciate any feedback that users have to let us know where we should prioritize our efforts. So I just wanted to make sure if anybody watching this video hasn't already um, to go check out dscommunity.org. This is kind of the hub for everything going on in the DSC community. You can link from here out to the Slack channel and you know participate in very active conversations. Um, there's also a uh, community call that happens, I think, every six weeks. Uh, there's also a PowerShell community call, so I'm sure that link has been floating around throughout the summit sessions. Um, and from here, you can also get a listing of all the current community resources and link out to each of their GitHub repos. And so it's a really nice place if you're new to DSC to find information, figure out um, you know, where, this, where this fits in for you and how to get involved in the open source efforts around the community. Yeah, just to make a quick shout out to Gail, who is one of the key folks in the DSC community. Uh, we've been working closely with him um, since the initial idea of putting DSC in PowerShell 7. So really appreciate a lot of the feedback he's provided um, 
as you know, he starts experimenting writing DC resources for Linux. Mm -hmm. So thanks for everyone for watching this presentation. Uh, I think if you have any additional questions about GIST configuration or DSC, feel free to reach out to Michael and myself on Twitter. Uh, there's our handles. Any last words, Michael? No. I'm really looking forward to the next year. I think uh, people are going to be happy to see new capabilities for DSC and PowerShell 7 and in Azure Guest Configuration. Um, I'm looking forward to going back and looking at a lot of those user voice items that have been open for a long time and finally marking them as closed. So uh, pretty exciting. Great. Thank you, everyone.